Welcome back, everyone, from our two-week break. Series 34 is starting very soon, where we welcome Nick Butler to discuss the modular world-building game, Tidebreaker. But before we get to that, we have some announcements. First up, the OneShot Network is participating in the World Builders fundraiser to help support Heifer International. Uh, at different goals, we will unlock some really cool perks. We've already unlocked Patrick Rothfuss uh, being a guest on All My Fantasy Children and James D'Amato doing some luminary readings for folks. Uh, next up is a reorder of more of the Baganalia handkerchiefs that everybody really wanted. And I keep seeing mm -hmm. people being like, where can I get them? And everyone's like, you're too late. Well, now you're yeah. not. Mm -hmm. uh, shortly after that, inviting Jeff and Aaron from All My Fantasy Children to create some content for Skyjacks. You can check all of this out at wb2020.charactercreationcast.com or the link in our show notes. Mm -hmm. Uh, next up, if you joined my design partner, Amer, Amerez, uh, for their Cape and Blade mini campaign that wrapped up this last Friday, thank you so much. Uh, it was very exciting. Uh, and uh, with such a talented uh, group of individuals playing, uh, there were definitely many tears at the end there. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, they have the entire show on demand on the Utopia channel. So absolutely check that out if you haven't already. Um, otherwise, you can join me uh, for the next two Fridays in a row Whoa. Uh, for for my Chimera campaign stream uh, as we prepare for a two week break uh, over the Christmas and New Year's uh, holidays. You got to get it all in before. We do. We were, uh, we were thinking to originally go on Christmas Day. Just say, you know what? We'll do it. We'll do it Christmas Day. But then, you know, let's give everybody a little bit of a Christmas break. That's fine. Oh, but well, what's more Christmas than time with friends? I mean, that's very fair. Because, like, we're not spending time with anybody else. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I say I live with my family, so. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> They're always so. here, whether it's Christmas or not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I see them every day. <laughs> Whether <laughs> I want or to not or make not. It into the episode. <laughs> uh, uh, but we also have a phenomenal cast, and the story has been quite exciting as well. Uh, and you can tune in at 7.30 p.m. Central Time, uh, both of those Fridays. Um, where can they tune in? Oh at, yeah. At I always forget something. You I can know. go to <laughs> you can go to twitch.chimera.games and it'll go right to my channel. Also, uh what if people haven't been watching the first few? Are, you know are what? they on demand somewhere that we could find they, them? They are also on demand at twitch.chimera.games or you can go to youtube.chimera.games to get to our YouTube channel which has all of them on the backlog. Well, thanks Ryan. This has been super helpful. <laughs> Thanks, Amelia. You're welcome. <laughs> I think that's all we have for announcements for today. For now, you can stick around after the show for our call to action and we get to read a review. Woo. Woo. Uh, until then, let's get to the show. Yeah, enjoy. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia, and this episode, my co-host Ryan and I are excited to welcome Nick Butler, designer of the game we are covering today, Tidebreaker, a collaborative world-building RPG where you play as hyper-competent heroes. Welcome to Character Creation Cast. We're really excited to have you here, Nick. Hey, how you doing? I'm Nick. Um, follow me at Twitter, follow my bleed. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, let's uh, start by introducing you to our audience. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about yourself, where we can find you online, uh, and what projects you're currently involved in? <laughs> uh, well, you guys pretty much covered all of that, and I 
covered where you could find me. So <laughs> <laughs> there you I, go. I suppose we're just going to be working with the, the telling you about telling the audience about myself part. Then. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> well, uh, it's 30 cents from Connecticut. I've been doing this for a couple of years now. I made a couple of small games that I'm too shy to actually talk about. Um, but I have a HIO if you want to see one of them. It's a little cool game called The Desiccated. You put the hit point system is a bottle of water. And oh. That's, oh. Yeah, it's neat. Uh, oh. Interesting. In my home. <laughs> game, I think it's okay, let's pause. Let's go check out that game and then we'll be back in a few. <laughs> <laughs> pause recording, click. <laughs> Come back for the actual episode. Okay. <laughs> Well, let's go ahead then and get right into the game. And we are going to discuss what this game is all about. What's in a game? Um, usually we like to start with the setting as our first question, but this game doesn't have a setting yet. Um, so what made you want to create like a setting neutral collaborative world building kind of game? Well, um, I'm a very big fan of having the players do most of the work for me because I hate jamming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on that. (laughs) Yeah, so I basically was like, you know what? If I have to be a forever GM, I'm going to make it as easy as possible for me to run this. Um, Because I feel like, you know, there's a lot of folks that are kind of like me, like in my my personal experience. But I know there's a lot of people that actually love GMing. So, like, this this game is uh, very much for the GM as much as it is for the player. And I just think that since everybody's telling stories together, why not make mechanics that actually support people telling stories together? So like I mm. uh, went out with the express purpose of developing a toolkit that allows both the players and the GM to have uh, similar levels of narrative control, you know, and I was very inspired by um, Fate Accelerated. Um, Fate Core is great too, but like I'm more of a fan of Accelerate just because it's like really just easy to get into. Mm. Um, and I was looking at it And I was like, wow, like this game is like deceptively deep in a way, right? Like if you Mm -hmm. like really think about like the um, applications of the different um, moves and stuff that you can do in the game, like particularly like the, uh, like creating obstacles and stuff, like I can't remember offhand, but like you could do things like say, hey, there's an aspect on this thing where I just set this thing on fire. It's got like a three point um, difficulty rating to overcome now. And if you step into this zone, now you're on fire. Right. Um, mm. Because people mm-hmm. like look at fate um, and go, oh, wow, or there's no like crunch or no tactics in this game. But I'm like, well, you're not really like looking into all the options like mm-hmm. with enough with a creative enough mindset. But the problem with fate is that it doesn't really explain all the cool things that you can do because like, you know, like it expects like a certain type of audience where like they're going to jump in and yeah. just be like really creative with it. Um, but in that sense, it's also failing potential customers where it's just like, hey, not everybody is like super like into just like reading through the whole book and going, wow, look at all these cool things I can do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there's definitely a level of like mastery that you're expected to come in with or like a base level of knowledge, like an amount of prerequisites that they sort of expect you to have to be able to come into a lot of these games. Yeah, exactly. And it's a fantastic game. I love Evil Hat. I actually want to like sell my game to Evil Hat. <laughs> um, but Call him Evil Hat. <laughs> Yo, Sean, holla at me. <laughs> uh, now I gotta send him an email. <laughs> That's a business worth kids. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah, but um, I, I went into building the game in a way where it was just kind of like I really like games with tactical options and crunch, but I like all the fluffy world building stuff too. You know, um, I, I like being able to immerse myself into like these little universes that me and my friends or whoever is playtesting with me at the time um, help develop, right? Mm-hmm. And like, uh, I found that in my experience that a lot of these indie games are fantastic at that, but at the expense of like doing anything with nuance, like play tactically, right? And I was like, wow, that's a bummer. So I have to either do this or play D&D. And I was like, no, it's a ladder. <laughs> I'm not going so back. obviously it's making back. my own game then. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so, you know, like that does that. You know, I just kind of wanted to like take the best of the two different extremes that I like. Because like to me, it's really 
two very opposite spectrums both mm-hmm. between crunch and fluff and they don't always like uh blend together well right yeah, yeah. like there's that's definitely many arguments dichotomy. against it but yeah it's exactly it's definitely a dichotomy that's the perfect word for it and um i feel like tidebreaker is my attempt at trying to uh make peace of that mm-hmm. very cool uh, so what do we need then to play this game? Dice and a little bit of experience watching a whole bunch of action movies and stuff. That's pretty much it. Oh, nice. Maybe right. some paper, a pen, or a computer. You know, you know, writing utensils and stuff. Friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one that always, that's the one that I always trip up on. Is they're like, you need friends. And I'm like, oh. That's okay. Because I, I might part. make a solo version of this. Ooh. All right. My former boss, <laughs> God bless him, uh, Smunchy Games, at Smunchy Games on Twitter, like, he's a good guy. Uh, he's really into solo RPGs, and, like, he's uh, also kind of like a marketing guru, like Loki. Um, and he's like, I've been seeing a trend where there's more interest in solo RPGs because, not just because of the pandemic, he was telling me this, like, a year or two ago, right? But mm-hmm. people yeah. are starting to buy, like, more systems that offer those kind of um, experiences where, like, you can just get the game and just be like, hey, I've got dice, a little bit of time, and nobody's available, but I want to feel, oh, I want to be role-playing, right? Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And, like, that's a that's an untapped market for the most part. Like, if we have, like, Mythic GM emulator and, like... I don't have the same level of investment as him. So like I, that's all I can think of at the top of my head. Right. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like a few minutes of research and that's what I could find. Yeah, yeah. There are definitely times where I'm like, Oh, I love RPGs so much. Like I want to play a game, but also like, Oh, I don't want to talk to other people. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, oh. it's like, in okay, mm-hmm. Mythic GM emulator. And then I have to go back into like 1978 for like, like tunnels and trolls. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> So I, I know there's a lot of journaling games that are kind of uh, becoming popular now. Yeah, too. those are cool. Yeah. I, I have Quill. Uh, mm-hmm. Quill is journaling, journaling RPG. That's pretty cool. Like, I looked at that. I was like, wow, this is kind of neat. Um, yeah, actually, you know, I have a whole folder. I think full there's, of those. isn't it Beast, too, I started. Um, and then, like any other kind of journaling exercise I tried to do, it lasted for about four days and then I fell off. <laughs> Um, but I know there are a few of them that look super interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The tiebreaker is not the focus for solo because it's a collaborative game. So like you can't really collaborate for alone. But like I do plan eventually on making like a solo variant. Just because like, hey, That's I feel cool. like crunching somebody out of the window, but you know, only get me and my dice. So like right, yep. one day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gotta get you kicked out of person. <laughs> exactly. <Right. laughs> What kind of stories and themes is this game meant to explore? Like, obviously, if you're building your own world, it's a little bit open. But are there particular, like, concepts and ideas that you feel this game is well-suited to? Um, I feel like this game really does well when you're doing themes of, like, uh, fighting against oppression and stuff like that. Like, you know, it's just your typical action movie plots, right? Um, it's just you versus the bad guys. And if that happens mm-hmm. to be punching them or if it happens to be trying to convince them that they're wrong, uh, like making a dramatic speech on a, on a crate and just being like, hey, you have to treat people nicely. You know, right? Mm-hmm. And then you make cool rules and stuff for that. Like the game does great for things like that. Like anything where you can really tap into the melodrama like without like romance and stuff because I don't really have any mechanics for that. Like it's 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 not like a like a kissing game or something like that. Like this is a this is a game where most of my work went into punching people or talking to them. <laughs> yeah. Although I'm sure it could be if you try hard enough. Oh absolutely. But like you can argue that <laughs> I mean there is always the like enemies to lovers. Ever. Like my uh, Exactly. My my whole my whole spiel is that find the right game for for the right kind of um, story that you want to tell. Right? Yes. Exactly. So yes. like, yeah, we, we talk about that a lot. Not every game is meant to do everything, mm-hmm. and there are millions of games out there. And like, whenever people are like, "I don't know," it just like wasn't or that my favorite of like, I don't know, just reskin it for D and D. No, there's already a game to do that thing. Yeah, there's that you a game that do. does that specifies mm-hmm. how to like, do it, gives you extra like. 
right? Like, has um, the mechanics to keys like and stuff and prompts and things that do everything that you possibly could want about like cooking a chicken, <laughs> right? <Yep>. Uh-huh. Yes, <laughs> like mechanics reinforce the feel of a game. That's yeah, why and, something like Starcross works great with a Jenga tower and not with dice because it can feel dread. that tension or like yeah. Yeah, just, shout out to Epidia. That's my homeboy. Yes, mm-hmm. like he's he's definitely a big influence on me because you know like Dread was just one of those games where like we were talking uh, off record record about um, everyone is Sean because like of just things that you could do in RPGs that you wouldn't have thought about before, right? Yeah, right. Like yeah, just, totally. Like make you rethink what what is a game? Yeah, and what asynchronous is it, you know? party mechanics, right? It's just like holy crap, we're all the same person. Like what? Like yeah, right? but you know, there's a, there's a toolkit for everything. But yeah, going back to the the romance thing, like I was, I just like just not on me. Like thirsty sword lesbians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. that that yeah, would be exactly. the game. Like don't play my game, play hers. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, like her game's way cooler about that. And I think there's like a, a I think there's a, a play. A playbook, I think that's what they call them, PBTA, PB, right? It's been a while. Mm-hmm. Where, like, mm-hmm. you can do that Zoro thing where, like, you, like, slash your, like, your, like, initials into somebody's closing. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, Jay Pande is, like, a good friend of mine. And he was telling yeah. me about Thirsty Swords Lesbians. And I actually got to talk to uh, that game's creator on stream. Like, she was in the chat. Like, me and uh, Jay were streaming, like, some card game that he was playing. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, she was telling me about that. And I was like, What? <laughs> like this game is amazing like I games are this. so good yeah, <laughs> like, like, I'm not in your target cool demographic things. but I'm probably going to cop that anyway just to see those mechanics because like I'm a big yeah. fan of game mechanics like just in general oh, absolutely. Right? you know yeah. so mm-hmm. like shout out to Thirsty Swords lesbians like you know somebody yeah. y'all, y'all should cop that <laughs> <laughs> absolutely unfortunately the Kickstarter is over with at this point uh, very successful uh, at that uh, but oh, yeah. keep an eye out for it uh, for when it's available they're, for purchase. Because, because my goodness, oh, yeah. I, know, I mean so. it's evil hat, so like get they'll it. have actual copies somewhere. Yeah, yeah, they're, get they're it, just going to be it. in a store somewhere. Grab that when it comes out. <laughs> sure, for sure. Uh, so, what do characters do in Tidebreaker? <laughs> Depends on what you want them to do, really. But um, mm-hmm. you know, you are basically playing through a story. Sometimes it means fighting. Sometimes it means negotiating things. That sometimes it means sneaking through a dungeon or something. Like it depends on the world you build. Like I have mm-hmm. mechanics for fighting. I have mechanics for diplomatic negotiations. I have mechanics for sneaking and backstabbing people and taking over territory, whatever, whatever. But uh, yeah, the game does very well at action, espionage, diplomatic stuff. Okay, is it is it kind of modular then, where you can just ignore? full aspects of the system if you really wanted to um audience you can't see me but i'm nodding super duper hard (laughs) (laughs) i feel like we've touched on this a little bit but i want to hear from you personally what do you think is unique about this game like what makes this stand out from other games that you've read or played oh my game is more of an homage to a lot of the other games that i've uh, played so mechanically speaking it doesn't have much that's truly unique about it, but I feel that the way that I've implemented all of these older mechanics um, kind of revitalizes them, right? I was having a conversation on Twitter the other day where, like, uh, explode, explosions, for instance, right? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, hit a number, you get more dice. Yeah, yeah I get to roll huge dice. Like, that's been done forever, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I split it. You know, so like you get the exploding thing while you roll like a six or whatever, and then you get more dice. Um, but I feel like I might be one of the only people that have done it so that you can do it on different numbers for one, for instance. Mm. And I have something called igniting, which is just a reroll, right? But the ignite mechanic can also hit on different numbers. So what we do is we have something called showstoppers. Um, showstoppers is uh, you do a stunt. And like I said, I'm inspired by Fate Core. So the stunts are actually mm-hmm. not like Fates. They're more like Exalted's, where where the definition there is like, you give me a cool description, I give you more dice. So mm-hmm. describe things and entertain me. You get more clicky clackies. Let's look at the clicky clackies. 
<laughs> but guess I, what? More of those be fun. <laughs> listeners to this podcast will know that that is the one thing I like about Shadowrun is rolling a bathtub full of dice. The same like, mind mm-hmm. game. It's There's Shadowrun about the change. Like, very, <laughs> like, very satisfying about being like, look at this handful of dice I have. Look I at this bucket that pools. I got I from Games them. Emporium, for, which is normally for World po- Warhammer, <laughs> but is meant for my character because I min max this the hell. <laughs> right? Like, there's something that, like, I have decorative vases in my room, like, that are just filled with my dice because I'm like, ooh, those are pretty. And I want to, like, look at them. A- and I just want to, like, grab handfuls at, like, something tactile about that, like, that is a nice decorating touch. Back back to what I was talking about. Um, yeah, stunts give you more dice, right? Um, so we have showstoppers. Well, what showstoppers are is when one of your stunts like actually makes somebody like giggle or visibly like clap or something. Like you, it comes down to a vote. Like, is this worthy of a showstopper? A show of hands. Yes. Cool. Now all of the um, rolls that you have ignited also explode. Ooh. So we do that a little differently from something like, say, Feng Shui. Shout out to Robin Moss because uh, he was one of my biggest uh, influences because I Feng Shui is like the OG, like action movie role playing game. Right. Like, mm. have you not played that? That game's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like it's a product of the 90s. Like even the, the recent update is basically Feng Shui one, but slightly cleaner. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I feel like personally, it takes away a couple of the options which uh, feels like, yeah, but you know, that's just, that's just me. Like, it's still a great mm. game. Fun Toy 2 is fantastic. Um, cop that too. Um, <laughs> man, I feel like I'm <laughs> pitching more of other people's stuff in mind. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like that's also kind of like, hey, man, like, I love games. If people don't see that, like, then, um, but back to the question, what does my game do differently? I, I like I said, I do uh some traditional die rolling mechanics a little differently um my world building mechanics are like very focused on being player centric i Mm. take the meta resources that you've seen in like stuff like champions and fate and exalted whatever whatever and i spread those out so like i take things and i take what's good about them and then i add more of it right so it's like hey Mm -hmm. you like hero point systems like you like being able to re-roll things you like being able to say hey i want to spend a meta resource to establish an idea you get all of that but the players get it and the gm gets it and the gm also gets a little bit less power because of it because he has to he she they has to rely on their uh doom resource right because it's split Mm -hmm. between hope and doom hope being the player side doom being the, the gm side but the GM mm-hmm. can do stuff with that pool that they can't do in most games without, like, um, in a way that hasn't been, like, codified to my knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, you can do something simple, like, called a Harbinger, where a Harbinger is just, like, putting a bullet into Chekhov's gun, so to speak. Mm-hmm. You don't even got to tell the players what's going on. You just have to drop that one point of doom and then watch them squirm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm just gonna oh, put no. this here for later. You'll see. Oh, that, that nice little flower petal lady that you like, Harbinger. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> no, what's gonna happen to her? And in the back of your mind, you're like, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea what's gonna happen to her, but I'm gonna take this your is worst like suggestion. The most relatable, like <laughs> as somebody like we we do have not been doing because hey mental health yeah um but we we do a whole series on player advice that i wanted to start because i don't like running games and i'm like we need more for players Um, i saw that post that was a good post i yeah i i i hate running games i just i hate them um it's not a thing that's fun for me like more power to you if you're a forever gm and you love it but i don't um but this sounds like the kind of thing that like i'm I miss when I'm GMing is like being able to like, you know, like affect things in that way. I mean, which I know that people are like, oh, the GM has all the power and you can do whatever you want. But I just feel like it's too many, too many variables to like. Yeah. And it's also just like the players will like yell at you and you get rules lawyers and stuff. Like my rules say like, oh, yes, I know you built this character that relies fully on making every single roll you make explode and getting 36 dice. I said no to bad guy lives. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Why? Because I have doom left and I'm going to no sell that. 
So stop. I mean, maybe you just had me at Doom. Maybe I was like, oh, if the GM's the one that gets the Doom, I'm here for that. Yeah. Like, maybe that's more about my personal aesthetic than anything else. Yeah, we we offer a lot of GM tools to keep your bad guys alive when you need them to be alive. Yeah. But in a way that's fair, because, like, eventually you're going to run out of Doom, and then that player is going to land that hit to, like, smack that bad guy back into oblivion where they belong you know what i mean mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. but beyond that it's just like wow actually i do have more things that are unique about this system than i thought um i i take a lot of influences from things like street fighter okay um so this is actually going to be more like gasp 40 um <laughs> but better because reasons um, yeah. <laughs> where i i focus a lot on movement Okay. Where I feel a lot of tabletop RPG combat is very static, like as far as how your pieces move on the board. Because I really like board games, I like fighting games. Mm-hmm. You know, so Tiebreaker takes a lot of that. It doesn't like shove it down your throat or anything. You could definitely sit there in the same zone and just throw abilities at somebody and then win eventually, right? Mm-hmm. But for those that want a more like lively experience where they could feel like they really outplayed somebody, like you have options to lots of movement abilities and i feel like that's really important because like you can do things like say the wake function allows you to move and then trigger where you were so the attack lands there instead of like you having to run up to the guy swing right Mm -hmm. so you can run away and then swing it doesn't have to be like a ranged attack or anything like it's still melee yeah Yeah, i mean but you can do things like that. Um, we have the the abilities are built in an ADC system, and there's a lot of functions that call upon what what ability that you're using that turn, or what ability your enemy's using that turn. And you can play like a rock paper scissors kind of guessing game, oh, okay. where like if you guess the right thing, you get bonuses and they get poo. Or you can just absolutely just be like, oh, were you relying on that one thing that you min maxed to death? That that's your A ability. Mm-hmm. Stop! You yeah. don't want to stop? Cool. I get a free counterattack for that. <laughs> yeah. You gonna stop yet? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's but then cool. it becomes more like a fighting game, where yeah, it's yeah. just kind of like, okay, now I know your move set, so now I have things to counter for it. Yeah. Um, and also our progression, where like you're locked down on your choices for most games, where like you make a choice and then you have like buyer's remorse for that choice. Well, tiebreaker says, well, you can respect like whatever. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's just one of our progression options. The other thing is that we have something called tricks. So, like, where you have something, uh, when you do a stunt, you can go, you know what would be really nice that I didn't think about when I was uh, going through character creation? Because I know that there's tons and tons and tons and tons of options in this game. This mm-hmm. is a toolbox system. It's it's based on things like um, Aaron Clooney's Thrash. It's based on, like, champions and stuff. Mm-hmm. Or Big Eye Small Mouth. Or, like, you have options for days and then you mix those options to make your powers mm-hmm. that's that's intimidating to some people like that's a weakness of the system but it's also one of its greatest strengths mm-hmm. so like what we have is tricks so just make your abilities just just put a couple of on see how it works but a trick what it does is like you do your stunt and you go hey i wanted that function because that feels like it'd be a good a good fit mm-hmm. cool you have it you know, so if you just had like a ranged like Bernie attack or something like that, but you said, you know what I really wanted to do? I wanted to do AOE. You can just be like, hey, I described this in a way where I'm able to apply massive to this. And now everybody in that zone can suck on fire. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's so, cool. Yeah, we've, we've got things to keep things, uh, keep things fresh, fresh for the players, fresh for the GM. It's just, there's options, mm-hmm. lots of options. That's what I do different. I like it. Uh, so th- let's go over the, a little bit of the history of Tidebreaker. Um, I, I know it's been in development for about two years now. Yeah. Um, and uh, still ongoing, but it's, it feels like it's in a very good place right now. We're basically finished. Um, I'm doing a couple of optional mechanics at the moment while I'm waiting for money to pour in. Because mm. uh, art is expensive, graphic design is expensive, printing is expensive, yeah. editing is expensive, and I need all of that. <laughs> like, if you've bought the, the game already, you've probably seen that I am very terrible at graphic design. I like to feel like I'm very, very good at making mechanics. I just can't put them on paper in a way that doesn't look ugly, which is right. why I'm going to pay other people to do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, wh- when did the concept for this actually start forming? Oh, funny story. Um, 
I mentioned Smudgy earlier. Uh, mm-hmm. This game was originally called Octane, and I made it as a bet because I was uh, wanted to flex my my creator creative muscles cool. uh, to him because he had uh, another designer that doesn't work for him anymore. And I was like, "Look, I'm better than that guy. You should hire me to make stuff." And um, I was like, "Give me a month, and I will give you the bare bones of a game that will outsell anything this guy could ever make." Mm-hmm. And he was like, <laughs> do it. <laughs> and so I was like, you're on. And then I did. And then Octane was born and that eventually became Tidebreaker. Nice. Yeah. And so then we worked together for a while. It was great. But um, for reasons that I can't express on uh, on air, uh, we parted ways. I ended up owning owning the game. So now I'm on my own with, uh, with this game. Mm-hmm. Very cool. But yeah, it was born on a bet. Which I won. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the best way you're like, but you can't do it. Mm, but I can. <laughs> like, yeah. Normally, He's, before. Uh, he hit me with that Morpheus. He was like, I know Kung Fu. And he was like, show me. And I was like, will I? <laughs> <laughs> so good. <laughs> before we dig into like the official character creation, world creation stuff, um, we want to go over a few terms and concepts that people might need to know to follow along. Um, so we've made like a short little list here. Um, let's start with stats, maybe, um, which, you know, people probably know what they are, but if you want to explain. <laughs> stats, they're how you do things. Yep. <laughs> That's the tweet. No, no, but seriously. Um, <laughs> so they're numbers yeah, that represent. Statistics, yeah, statistics. Stats, we call them stats. Uh, they represent your character's ability to do things. They're more similar to approaches in Fate Accelerated than they are to, say, like a strength, death, con, split, or whatever in D&D. Um, because any stat can be used to do any role as long as it seems feasible. Okay. Right? So they're very they're very loose. Like, might you would think it's like, oh, yeah, that's strength, that's power, that's punching people really freaking hard. Yeah, it is, but it's also being a forceful personality, mm-hmm. right? You know, so like me interviewing would be a might roll. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like, yeah, I'm fat. So like I my might does not represent me being able to hit people hard. It's more of like my charisma. You know what I mean? I'm not being tricksy. I'm not because that would be more of like wits or something like that. Mm-hmm. This isn't really me being one of those guys that like... uh Post really, really long, like detailed mechanics, like uh, breakdowns and things about why this game is great, why this isn't bad, and why these people are horrible because colonialism or something like that. Mm-hmm. That that's more of like an intuition role in my game. Mm-hmm. I'm not that guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Mike character. <laughs> Fair enough. Like I sell my stuff by force of personality, basically. <laughs> But th- that's how our stats work. Um, so I could I could have done that with wits, and I would have failed the role because mm-hmm. I'm not smart. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, there's different kinds of intelligence, and intelligence being like something that can be boiled down into one stat or two is kind of icky, and I try to avoid that by mm-hmm. having that be expressed anyway. Even though I have wits and intuition, mm-hmm. which would be like mostly like mental, but mm-hmm. you can get people with wits in this game. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like wits yeah. is like about like using what you know. It's not like yeah, how much you, you know. know it's way, like, like what you do with it. Right. That's how we try to express it in this game. Yeah. Um, and so like the stats come in three pairs. Like we have might and endurance, where might be in the offensive one, endurance being the defensive one. Mm-hmm. We have agility and focus, which would offensive, defensive, and then we have wits and intuition, offense, defensive. Okay. And basically it's hit things directly, hit things quickly or accurately, and hit things in a clever way um, when you look at it from combat numbers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how the three pairs work. But as far as every other application, it's completely open. Mm-hmm. That's how the stats work in this game. That, that's the basic stats. Oh, very cool. Um, there's secondary stats, but like, if you want me to go over those, we can go over those. Mm-hmm. We can yeah, do them as they come up, things. I think. Yeah. I'll do them as they come up. Um, we'll do it live. Yeah. We'll do it live. <laughs> yeah. uh, what about advantages? Do those work like um, kind of how you'd expect? Yeah, advantages, they're, they're basically just going, here's all of the math I have to present. Do I pass? Mm-hmm. 
Um, well, the advantages are your stats to your stunts. There are any like random bonuses that you get from a function. They're like doing a sneak attack or something because we have like a surprise round thing, which is not like a D and D style surprise round. It's just kind of like, Hey, I snuck up on the guy. Can I add my wits to this too? Yeah, there you can. There you go. That's your advantage. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much what advantages are. Okay. I should just rename that to numbers. Just be like flat. Like this is my numbers pile. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we talked a little bit about uh, stunts a little bit, uh, but is there anything else that we need to know about stunts for uh, actually creating our characters? Nope. You just know that you describe things, you get more numbers. It's good. <laughs> Very cool. Um, and then I saw there was uh, botches and explosions. Oh yeah. Botches. Uh, we covered explosions. We've covered ignite already earlier, right? Um, mm-hmm. Explosions add more dice. Ignite reroll dice. Um, botches also no botches don't reroll dice anymore. What botches do is they remove successes because hmm. this is a success based system. Your successes are four, five, and six. Uh, a botch, if you have botch, comes in three levels. So so does ignite. On um, botch one, all ones remove a success. On so botch two, all ones and twos removes a success. Botch three. Every single failure that you can roll removes success. Ooh. Where Ignite does it the opposite way, where Ignite 1 does 6, Ignite 2 does 5, Ignite 3 does 4s, and it's sequentially adding the um, previous numbers and stuff, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, Ignite always triggers before Botch if you happen to have both. Um, I'm going to add that to an FAQ later, but because um, this is a game about hyper competence. So, like, yeah. you know, if you're good at stuff, you're going to represent you being good at stuff first before you represent how people are trying to screw you over. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Very cool. Um, and then I think we already covered Showstoppers as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Be entertaining. Get more numbers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so do you think that, it, is there anything else that we should know before we go into it or just uh, learn as uh, we go? No, not really. There's a couple of other like basic mechanics, like um, the cliffhanger thing is kind of like skill challenges in 4E. Um, well, we do it a little differently where it's, tied collaboratively for like everybody to do it and all of your numbers get added up if they beat the dr it's like great if not they trigger what's called a nail biter which uh gives them another chance if they hit like the dr like half of the dr at least mm. otherwise you die <laughs> okay yeah because cliffhangers are usually just kind of thrown for that like miss- mission impossible kind of thing we're like yeah. oh i'm falling out of an airplane now i have to creatively f- not go splat when i hit the ground yeah or like, uh, oh, actually, one of the best examples I've seen in movies is uh, in one of the Triple S movies. Speaking of airplanes, the guy like falls out of an airplane and then like kind of like surfs on a car. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is Tidebreaker in a nutshell. <laughs> Surfing on a car, falling out of an airplane while fighting a bad guy. This is the game. Whoever does my art, that's what you're drawing. Draw that picture. You get hired. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I think uh, I think we're ready to make some people. I think let's so. do this. Yeah, let's make some people. Let's make some people. All right. So, what do we need to do first? All right. First things first is come up with a concept. Since we're not doing the actual setting things, I'll just provide a setting for you. You are Dragon Ball Z characters. Oh boy! I've never seen Dragon Ball Z. All right, uh, Dragon Ball Z. We're gonna go with it. It's fine. It's... I'm roughly familiar with it. I've been told that I should just watch the one episode where what's his name learns to drive, and then I'll be good. But I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> they are wrong because it's a classic. <laughs> um, but DBZ in a nutshell, it's uh, if you've watched any other shonen anime that come that came after it. Uh, does the tournament arcs. It's basically like humans and aliens fighting against people from space, fighting like whatever, whatever. Mm-hmm. But the setting is more or less Japan with mild sci-fi added to it and a lot of martial arts. Mm-hmm. Where martial arts in this instance is more just punching really, really fast, really, really hard, and then occasionally throwing fireballs. Yeah. I'm really excited to just get a bunch of angry letters because our listeners know that I have zero familiar an- familiarity with anime at all. So, um, I mean, unless actually that's not true because I have watched all of (laughs) Yu-Gi-Oh! But (laughs) other than that... (laughs) Well, you think of of DBZ as Yu-Gi-Oh! But take the cards out for punching. Okay, that's fair. Because the plot lines are very similar. All right. Mm -hmm. I can, like, I'm going to make it up as I go. And I'll deal with the angry letters later. It's going to be great. It's fine. 
Hey, tell I make you what, zero apologies. You send the angry letters to me and I will defend you because it's my fault. All right. Okay? <laughs> let's do it. Wonderful. Anyway. Okay, anyway, let's let's do some character generation. Let's yeah, make please. Some, let's make some knockoff DBZ guys. All right. Yeah. Basic plot. Really, really strong guys coming down to beat everybody up and take over the world or possibly blow it up because that's what they do. You're some sort of hyper competent martial artist. Make characters. All right. <laughs> like only limitation. You do some kind of punching. <laughs> All right. That's fine. All right. So let's see here. So I, I saw there was a quick checklist for character generation uh, in the uh, the early access PDF. Um, yeah, there on totally is. Page 117 uh, for those that are following along at home. And I apologize because for some reason... When I transferred the PDF from Google Docs to regular PDF, it took away all of the chapter headings. Oh, boy. So you have to actually, like, go through the table of contents and, like, know what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. I suck. I'm sorry. It will get fixed when I get an editor. <laughs> Absolutely. So it says the first step is make a concept for your character and pick a name. Oh, I don't like this game now. I'm sorry. I pick get picking names always goes last. Oh, we can skip the name. Okay, but it's it says okay. don't skip this. <laughs> well, don't, I mean, I would say don't skip the concept. Okay, that's true. At least okay, okay, okay. Do, do you want me to edit out the making the name part? Because <laughs> like, look, look, I we're we're it. still we're still kind of like in this nebulous form where like the game's not completely finalized yet. I mm -hmm. can do anything. Oh. Just that's my that's my let advice. Me is let me name my character last. <laughs> Yeah, help me help you, okay? Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> Mostly because that's the part I'm bad at. See, fantasynamegenerators.com. I'm so picky. That's my problem is I'm like, this name needs to fit perfectly. That's what I That's what I do. I do. I name all my NPCs that way. I name most of my characters that way. I go, like, I want a Tibetan monk or something like that. I go on Tibetan names and I start picking ones that sound cool. Mm -hmm. like, like, that's that's my that's my GM advice. Gee. There you go. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. So what's a good concept? One that makes you happy and describes your character enough where you can kind of get what you're going with it. All right. This part is the most selfish part of character creation. Your yeah. concept is basically for you to have a barometer for what's awesome about yourself. <laughs> All right. So I think I've got a, uh, a, a an okay concept. Okay, starting off here. So I know we're in a DBZ world, but I want a... Uh, Don't you dare say magical girl. I want a... <laughs> now I have to think of a creative way to say that. Because <laughs> <laughs> you did that last time. I know I did that last time, but I want I want um, a magical girl that is also hyper competent, not as a magical girl. Uh, okay. So, like a martial artist that like goes up a level when she transforms. So, like Sailor Mars. Effectively, yeah, right. Because I so, feel like she was good at stuff when she wasn't like Jup being Jupiter Marsy. as well. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, somebody that's well, pretty much like everybody but Serena, right? Pretty much. Or Usagi, like if you're like extra weeby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, so I, I want somebody that's, uh, you know, effectively, like, it, it, it I, I guess it fits really well with the DBZ sort of archetype of, like, you've got a good amount of power, and then you go Super Saiyan, uh, and you get that extra power sort of deal. Yeah, everybody that matters has a transformation of some sort. Yeah. So I mean, that, that's, for that's kind of the concept that I'm going for. <laughs> um, and I want my, like, transformation to be, like, uh, magic-infused martial arts. Right, I kind of dig that. So, like, uh, it's all physical, close combat, but like you're throwing fire punches or or like lightning kicks and stuff. Love it, <sighs> Ryan. <sighs> Love it. <laughs> okay. Fire punches, lightning kicks. I... Are we doing both? Let's do both. Yeah, both. Yeah. Yes. Obviously. Yeah. Like elemental, uh, elemental combat. Uh, and you already have three abilities. We just have to pick the functions for it. Oh, sweet. Yeah, yeah. A transform ability, you have a lightning punchy ability, and you have a fire punchy ability. Hmm. 
That's pretty much done. All right. Wow. I'm so, ahead of the game. Take yeah. that, Amelia. Um, and then, good concepts. Yeah. And uh, you also get to create a character, Nick. Do I? Yeah. 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 Cool. All right. Oh, man. What do I want to be? <laughs> Put me on the spot. <laughs> I think I uh, want to be somebody who, like, used to be really, really good and then, like, faded into obscurity and now is like, I'm back. That's my oh. concept. As far as I've gotten. Yeah. Yo, chat. She's making piccolo. Oh, no. <laughs> we got to help her make piccolo. <laughs> Or Vegeta. <laughs> and now I get all of the hate mail. <laughs> uh, let's see. Who am I going to make? Wow. Okay. Like, I thought I was just going to, like, guide you off through it, but I got, like, actually me by a sample and stuff. And oh my God, the pressure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. I think I'm going to make, I want to make, like, a, kind of like a TN model. Oh, that'd be cool. It's like a guy that actually does martial arts in the show. It's about martial arts, but nobody really does them. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to put that as my concept. TN knockoff. Because, <laughs> like, you don't have to be super serious. Like, I sometimes prefer it, but, you know, for an extent of time, we'll, we'll just, we'll do this. We'll just uh, play it by ear. Yeah. Very cool. All right, so we got our concepts. Uh, some of us uh, may have names or not, um, but we can save that for later. Uh, what is next? All right, so let's see. The next step on the character creation checklist would be naming your characters. So like, let's see. Uh, what we would be doing next is rolling our stats or just using a stat array. I like doing stat arrays personally. Mm. Um because I typically do all of the abilities in things, even though it's kind of like out of order, um, which I really just should write it in order that I do it. But I don't know. I'll, it's your game. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm just trying to like balance out like what I would do and what people typically like expect sure. when you're reading an RPG. Mm-hmm. So like I like coming up with the concepts, doing the stats and then doing all of, like the like their hooks and questions and stuff yeah like at the end like when i have like a fully formed idea of like who this person is yeah that generally works out better i think yeah but like some people like doing all of like the hey you know my guy was an orphan and like he's on a revenge quest and Mm -hmm. he's gonna do all this stuff and they have like no idea how they're gonna do it but like they have this really big dramatic race story like where Mm. they're like in a basket as a baby in the rain and they got picked up and they grew up and they got bullied and now they're coming back and like they gotta fight the sephiroth knockoff and it's gonna be cool (laughs) (laughs) but i'm like but what did he do Mm -hmm. i don't know like, do they have a gun? Yeah, a gun works. Like, but you know, it's more about the personality for yeah. those kind of players. And I love those people because those kind of people, like, they have really good concepts. And then, like, we're just like, hey, like, how about this? Like, do you want to do like a mecha or something like that? Or it's like, well, I wasn't really thinking of a mecha because, you know, like, I'm like an orphanage kid. It's like, well, we could be like hired to go off into like a military complex or something where they later train out to become a Gundam pilot. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Or an armored corps or whatever. Yeah. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, that's kind of sex. Yeah, you know, and then we move on from there. Anyway, I'm uh I'm dithering a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we do our stat creation. So um I'll leave it up to you if you want to do roll your stats or if you want to do the stat arrays. All right. I was I was literally thinking earlier today, we haven't done a game that allowed me to roll stats in a long time. Um, and I was curious if this game did that or not. And uh, since it's an option, I really want to do that. Yeah, let's roll some stats then. All okay. right. Um, so what kind of dice do we need? d We use d for absolutely everything in this game oh, because I don't like having to get more than one kind of dice unless that dice is actually used for a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> I've got to get my blue d6s because this game has a water theme in the name. Yes, based off of Poseidon. Hmm. It's the Trident. Uh, also, Neptune, uh, which I'm very familiar with. I mean, it's like the same dude. Exactly. Yeah, it's just like, the you know, Romans just kind of like took their idea and said, we don't like that name, we can't pronounce it. Yep. We're going to name him this instead. <laughs> of course, of course, mine's named after a sailor scout, so. Ah, uh, that's fair. <laughs> oh, 
All right, it's so almost like Ryan has a thing for for magical girls. Magical I don't girls. know what you're talking about. This has never come up before ever. Yeah, there's a <laughs> magical girl RPG coming out from one of my friends. I forget which one is doing it, but they're in my Discord server. And I'm sorry, I don't remember which one of you is working on that. If you hear this, hmm. but check that out, and maybe we'll name drop them later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so how many D6s do we need, and how many times do we get to roll? Okie dokie, you're going to need 10. Oh. Yeah, you, you get 10, and then um, you roll that for each pair of stats. Oh, okay. And uh, you just count up the number of successes that you get. So we start teaching you how the success system works, like right from character generation. All right, so how do successes work? <laughs> Anything four or higher. Right. Oh, fun. So this is a very satisfying amount of dice off the bat. Uh, so I really like that. Uh, it says I'm also rolling for my own character. Let's yeah. see what they get. Yikes, that's three. <laughs> oh, that one pair is not going to be great. All right, I got six successes. That's not right, bad. So my first roll is one, two, three, four, five, six. I got seven, so I'm the winner so far. Oh, wow. So then what do we do with that success number? There. Nothing. Nothing yet. Okay. So we're going to do this two more times. Okay. So I'm just going to make note of that. Right, so let's see my next roll. I got... Oh, looks like I hit the dumpster on this one. I got a three. <laughs> And my final roll. Well, that one's only four. It's one, two, three, four, five. All right, I okay, got a three, four, a six, four. and a six. Oh. So I'm like, all right, two things, and we'll bad at one of them. Yeah, I got a seven, three, and a five. Oh, you I have like a nice. Yeah, my character's my character's looking okay so far. I got six four four. All right, so and now what you do is you assign one of those numbers to one of those pairs, and then you um, minimum is one for your stat, and maximum is five. Okay. So that three is going to be definitely a one two split in one of your. Uh, okay, so you just split that number up between the two. Yeah. Okay. So might and endurance, agility, focus, and within intuition, if you do it that okay. way. Actually, the stat rate version works the same way. It's just you're not rolling. You okay. just get the numbers. But with this, you have a slight chance of starting off with a 5-5 five five because you need like 10. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's might and endurance, agility and focus, and then uh, wit and intuition. Yeah. All right. So my TN knockoff... I'm going to base him off TN. I'm probably going to put his five into the wits and intuition split and give him a three in intuition and a two in wits. Because TN doesn't really trick people, but he's hard to trick. So we get okay. him that. Uh, and then you guys can kind of like make your own decisions based on how I'm doing it. Yeah. Um, he's not very particularly fast. Like, in fact, like he has the slowest attack in all of the series with his tribeam. Uh, well, no, I would say Piccolo's is the slowest of special beam cannon, at least early on. But um, anyway, that's just me getting into semantics. Uh, so we're going to say we're going to give him a two in focus and a one in agility. So like, if he has to actually try to hit something really fast, he's probably going to drop the ball there. Yeah. Um, but he's got an okay chance of dodging things uh, okay. based on speed and accuracy. And so that leaves the seven for might. Uh, Tien is a tough son of a bitch. Like, even by DBZ standards, considering his power level, like, is much lower than, uh, most of the main cast, like, he's survived some things that like, he has no business of surviving. So my Tien knockoff is going to follow that same lead, and I'm going to put a four in endurance and a three into might, which makes him fairly strong, cool. like, as far as, the uh, being direct and getting punched in the face or punching people in the face. He's pretty good at it. Yeah. Okay. So I went with uh, four in might um, and then three in agility. Uh, so kind of fast and, and very uh, forceful. Um, and a two in everything else except for focus, which I have at one. 
<laughs> yep, you're it's like you're getting shot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's also rip. Uh huh. Yeah, I did um, f- four in might, two in endurance, five in agility, one in focus, two Ooh. in wit, one in intuition. <laughs> nice. Uh, you've been matched that speed like super hard, huh? <laughs> yeah. So, um, oh, that's awesome. Let's see what we'll see. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this game uh, kind of encourages and discourages min matching based on um, what's called momentum. Mm-hmm. So uh, one of the main combat mechanics is uh, when you, whenever you miss an attack, you generate momentum equal to your wits, and then you can spend a certain amount of momentum. I believe off the top of my head, I think it's intuition. It's been a while since anybody's actually momentum shifted somebody in my playtest. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you can do what's called a momentum shift where normally, um, in combat, the defender picks what stat that they use and that determines what the offense has to roll. So if they want to block attacks, they pick endurance, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so Tian is going to go, <laughs> I'm blocking everything because <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. not fast, right? And then you go, no, Tian, I'm going to try to headshot you because you have that little big weak spot in your third eye on the top of your forehead. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, take, take the shots in your face. Okay. Uh, so in Amelia's case, where she has a one in her focus, they would be doing the same thing to her. So she's going blah, 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 blah. And then somebody says, no, stop. <laughs> mm-hmm. Dodge. <laughs> and then she gets hit. Okay. That makes sense. Cool. Yeah. So momentum shifting people can be very powerful. And it kind of keeps things a little fair when people like roll like ridiculously high numbers. Mm-hmm. So anybody has a chance to beat anybody. Like even that one that um, I have in agility, because of the way that um, our secondary stats work, which will be the next section that we're doing, like we're going to determine what our secondary stats are. Since I just started stopped uh, talking about momentum, so you get what's called power level in this game. Uh, okay. Power level is pretty much just like you get extra dice for things or extra whatever because you're awesome, and that's going to start at two. So okay. for um, power level gets added to all of your attacks and um, all of your secondary stats uh, save your momentum because that's a pool and attrition, which is a pool, which I'll um, explain later. And on the next secondary stat that we have is going to be called our critical value. The critical value is what it does is it determines if you got critical hit or not when somebody hits you. Uh, um, because your defensive stats, your endurance, your focus, and your intuition – like, that's what people have to roll to hit you, which we just covered, like, a minute ago. Mm-hmm. So, to determine your critical value, you're going to add your endurance plus your focus plus your power level. Okay. So, not TN has a critical value of four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, so, if somebody rolls an eight or higher, he not only gets hit, he gets crit. Um, Tiebreaker's health system is not numerical. Um, it has three states. You're either up, down, or out. And pass out, you're dead. Um, so, when you're up, you're fine. When you're down, like, you're on the defensive, you're on the ropes. When you're out, you're basically just trying to throw dirt in somebody's eyes and hoping they don't stab you in the face to finish you off. Mm-hmm. Um, you're crawling around, but you're still in the fight-ish. And so, anytime when you get hit, you go from up to down. If you get crit, you go from up to out. <laughs> okay. And if you're crit while you're down, you're dead. <laughs> okay. All right. So, with that said, that's how critical value works. That's how the damage works in this game. Um, and you have recovery value. Mm-hmm. Uh, recovery value being your net stat. That is your two offense, your two main offensive stats plus your power level. So, for those following along, that's might plus agility plus power level. Which gives Tien a recovery value of three, four, five, six. All and right. what recovery value does is when someone tries to counterattack you, and that's how you go from out or down to up. So you just try to punch people back. Like that's how you get up. There's other options to do it, but the main way is to just try to do a counterattack. And so if you hit people, like just normally, you go up just automatically you don't have to hit the recovery value to do it but what happens if you do hit the recovery value is that your counter attack does damage because otherwise you just kind of like get people off your back long enough for you to stand again but um recovery value just turns the tables on people so mm-hmm. like if say for instance uh me and you were in a fight with uh, tn versus your character amelia so like i amelia knocks me down okay? mm-hmm. 
Um, I try to hit her back. Oh, I know. Well, opposite way around. I knock Amelia down. Amelia tries to hit me back and she beats my sits for some reason because she's got a five in agility. So she's, she's rolling at least a seven if she doesn't decide to give her attack any sort of description, right? Mm-hmm. She does. She gets an eight, like bare minimum, right? So she has a really good chance of hitting that sits. Okay. Right. So if she hits the sits, she not only gets up, she knocks me down. Okay. Yeah, and that's how that works. Oh, cool. um, so if all this like bouncing up and down from uh, like quite literally, <laughs> tiebreaker is also very fond of puns. Mm-hmm. Um, you wonder like how do people finish each other off, right? Mm-hmm. And that's where the attrition pool comes in. Uh, so all of your successes rolled by your opponent, uh, regardless if like you were hit down or out, but as long as something connected get added to your get added to your attrition and the attrition gets added to any rolls that you have to make to recover so like her amelia's chances of rising up after i've like put her down a few times because i keep hitting her in her focus because she put a one there <laughs> mm-hmm. um are going to get even harder okay over time so eventually she will stop rising up and she will stay down and then i'll hit her again and she'll go out and it'll hit her again and she'll die <laughs> right or I'll just hit her like really freaking hard and just crit her and it takes a shorter amount of time. Okay. Um, and we already covered momentum. So that's the secondary stats. Okay. Yeah. And so those are your base numbers for this game. Very cool. Thanks for joining us for the first part of series 34, everyone. We had a lot of fun figuring out these characters and trying to tell Amelia what Dragon Ball Z is. Mm hmm. <laughs> Um, We are going to get to dive into some interesting character creation mechanics next next episode. So absolutely stick around for next week. In Mm. the meantime, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. If you are a Georgia resident, uh, please remember that today, uh, Monday, 12, 7, is your very last day to register to vote in the January runoff election. Um, And you don't even have to have had voted in the general election. Uh, You can still register. And even if you turn 18 after the general election, you are still allowed to vote in this runoff if you turn 18 uh, before or on the day of the runoff election. So check into that. Um, You can check your registration status by visiting www.mvp.sos dot g a dot gov and i encourage you to check on your status even if you are pretty sure you are already registered uh just to be safe uh, there have been stories of people losing the registration even though they just voted in the general election so so check into that easier to go to a website than to show up on the day of and have them say i'm sorry yeah you cannot vote exactly uh If you want to help out a really great organization, absolutely please check out the World Builders Fundraiser online. If you donate to it, please consider donating to the One Shot Fund, which will help us unlock some really cool perks as we raise more and more money. You can get to that fundraiser easily by going to wb2020.charactercreationcast.com or following the link in the show notes. And uh, before we get to that review, uh, I just wanted to remind everyone to check out my A Tale of Twinkle and Awe stream this coming Friday. You can go to twitch.chimera.games to see us at 7.30 p.m. Central Time, um, both this coming Friday and the next Friday. Um, Our heroes are actually attempting to wrangle a magical maelstrom that they accidentally created last episode. Oops. Uh, Yeah, so it should be fun to see how all of that plays out um, (laughs) and how much uh, joyful glee I get out of any of their failed roles. That's probably got to be the best part of GMing, I think. It really is. I don't get to do that, but I also delight in my own failure, so... um. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) We finally have a review again. Uh, We do still need more obviously. So mm-hmm. please leave us one on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podchaser, our Facebook page, etc., etc., etc. We will read it on the show. Like this one from Brick Steelhead. What a great wrestling name, by the way. That from the United name. States of America on iTunes. Titled, 
care gen front to back. CCC is the in-depth show you need covering one of the best parts of playing TTRPGs, cooking up the peoples. <laughs> <laughs> Where every tired, unedited, try-hard, actual play skips this wonderful step, CCC goes hard in the other direction to show how players, and the designers who love them, make CareGen simultaneously work as setting the foundation for the great story the group will tell, a primer on the rules and a setting, a mini-game of its own. Your hosts, Amelia and Ryan, are compassionate and caring, which I also do not hate. <laughs> <laughs> I wish for this show. I wish for the show to go from great to greater. Let's get some older games in there and also have some wild and wonderful character creation system. Where's the episode on Gamma World 7E? Uh, WFRP 3E, Eclipse Phase, Conan 2D20, Into the Odd, etc., etc. Dragon Passionate Fans as co hosts if you have to. I volunteer as tribute. <laughs> um, we have a number of those, I think, on our list. Yeah. Um, we've been like slowly. I'm. We're trying to like alternate. I think between newer and older games. The hard part mm -hmm. is that like they keep being Kickstarters for new exciting games, and so then we're mm -hmm. like, we have to cover it before the Kickstarter. Um, <laughs> also, I got to tell you, I have some like leftover trauma after doing Heroes Unlimited, and it has taken me a what? long time to recover. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also have to say, if that WFRP game is not a game about role playing in a radio studio, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you just role play as like NPR hosts. And <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only. Oh, yeah. We'll have oh to. Gosh, we'll let's have make to, that game. <laughs> we'll have to cover it to find out. Yes, we will. Well, thank you for the review. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And for the phrase, cooking up the people. <laughs> oh, I love that so much. <laughs> all right. With all of that out of the way, we will be back next week. Yeah. Have a good week, everybody. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you will find other great shows like Warda. Warda is an original fantasy actual play podcast created by Ali Grauer and Drew Marzieski. It's one part Game of Thrones 
two parts Downton Abbey, served on the rocks with a twist of Agatha Christie. Discover magic, mystery, and more than a little sociopolitical commentary along the way. The city holds thousands of stories. What will yours be?